So in this video, I want to cover how I felt that I improved in my second round of PhD applications compared to my first. Sorry, my cat is like, mm -hmm. you playful, you play. Okay. Cool. In this video, I want to talk a bit about how I felt I improved after my first round of PhD applications, what I wish I had done differently in my first round of PhD applications and how I really went to like switch that mindset from, oh my goodness, I'm a failure, I'm never gonna go into a PhD program to absolutely yes. You know when you apply to a PhD program and you get a rejection, that's just kind of sad. And everyone's talking about, oh my God, you're falling. Do your PhD program in the fall and that's just so exciting for them. But like, you're still feeling really, really sad because you didn't get into a PhD program. And I have 100% been there. That was literally me. I got rejected from everything. If you are a sensible PhD applicant, you have probably Googled how to make my PhD application. How can I write a really good PhD application? And those are like great things to Google and definitely some stellar advice out there. However, like it's kind of generic advice. And I took that advice the first time around and it was definitely useful and helpful, but it's not, if you go in with like just that, I don't think it's enough. But what I also want to say as a little caveat to this video is that this video is not a video on how to write your SOP or how to write a good personal statement or it's going to involve some out of the box thinking this video is about actionable steps that i took within the space of a year from getting rejected in the first time to getting in the second time so it's more of actionable real things that you could do to help you write that really great sop in a year's time just so we're all aware of where we stand in this video okay guys so let's talk about point number one so this is one of the things that i did to get more research experience and that was look for opportunities within my school to get involved in student journals. So this is either undergraduate journals, graduate student journals, but just like university or college journals. And I'm not talking about trying to submit a research paper here, no. I'm talking about being on the peer review committee or being an editor. So I got more experience with, I got involved in two of these when I was there and I really felt like this experience gave me something a little bit different from the side of research that people don't normally see. So skills like peer reviewing and being able to read and write constructive criticism, comments, all of these things are very important skills at graduate school, especially when it comes to like grant writing and stuff. I'm not saying that like an undergraduate journal is like a realistic experience of like an NIH study section. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying it's a nice way of getting involved in the world of research without actually having to do any research. It's like the other side of the publication process. So I thought that was kind of like a fun little out of the box way to get involved in research without actually doing any research. Oh, <laughs> sorry guys. You've just caught me working on number two that is gonna be a good way of getting more research experience. And that is writing a literature review or a knowledge summary. I'm so sorry, I've always wanted to do a really cringy transition like that. So <laughs> apologies. But yes, that brings me on to number two, which is writing a literature review or a knowledge summary. So a literature review, as you guys probably already know, but just in case you don't, is a nice critical summary of all of the literature on a certain topic. But it's not just a summary, it's supposed to give a kind of unique perspective and like maybe help stimulate some ideas as to where the field should go next within that area of research. So the good news about this is that a lot of the research, well, the research has already been done, you know, like someone else has written the papers. So if you have a niche or a topic that you're super interested in, you want to dive a little bit deeper in, then you can start writing a literature review. Now, I'm not saying that this will necessarily get published, but it is a good way of getting involved in scientific writing, showing that initiative and showing that you're genuinely interested in the science and the topic. And you you've taken time to read around that and I just feel like that really does show your enthusiasm and passion for the subject so that's definitely a great thing that you could talk about in your interview or and if we circle back to number one you could even submit it to some undergraduate student journals or like undergraduate research symposiums or stuff at your college or things at your vet school or med school or wherever because that's a great way of getting involved in like conferences and then you do have something like a little achievement to write on your um, CV like oh I presented it at this or oh I entered it and it got published in this undergraduate journal. Now the second thing that I mentioned was a knowledge summary and this is kind of veterinary specific. So if you are a fellow vet out there and you were looking to break into the world of research, this massively, massively, massively helped me in that year gap because it got me a peer reviewed published paper. And I cannot stress that enough. Like I really think that that was a good thing to do because it showed, as I said before in the literature review, like it showed initiative. Like I did this off my own back. I did this because I wanted to and I was interested. So it's a, basically a scheme run by RCVS Knowledge in the UK and they encourage clinicians
patients to submit questions like clinical questions regarding treatment and then people look into the literature and write a knowledge summary so it's basically a literature review and it helps you make a genuine contribution to the knowledge base whilst also giving you that valuable research experience so the third one the other one that i will say that really helped me in that little year was asking and making use of my network so what i did is i reached out to professors or clinicians in my case at the vet school who were actively involved in research or had maybe taken a more research orientated part in medicine if you're in that like medical field and i asked them if they were had any ongoing projects and if they needed any help and that like basically i just got involved in helping analyze some data or like learn how to code a little bit and all of that really helped me again build up more stuff that i could add to that sop within that year and help me have a stronger application overall i felt so definitely make use of your network there are going to be professors and lecturers like they all have to be involved in some kind of research or have been involved in some kind of research and if they're not then they might know who to ask. Another thing that I could do that you should do, that you could do, you could do whatever you want, is ask them whether they know of any programs or schemes that could help you get involved in research. So for example, I did this and I found out about the Cornell Leadership Program, which is a 10 week summer program for veterinary students from across the world to do research at Cornell. I didn't get in, sad, uh, but here we are, we're studying there now. So, you know, it's all going to be okay. That's like an option to try and apply to. Um, there's like little summer schools, maybe your college or university do summer schools. There's going to be research programs out there. There might even be some remote ones that you can do to get involved in research. So I feel like this kind of stuff is definitely very useful to know about and making use of your contacts and knowing who to ask. Just even having like a quick Google, like Google has been so helpful to me because I had no one to ask. Um, so just like Googling, it's going to be your best friend and see if there are any programs that you can get involved in. Again, going on about great opportunities, conferences. So maybe there are internal conferences or like larger conferences or like free online conferences, things like that, showing that you have an active interest in the research that you're wanting to do and adding more stuff like look I've done this I wrote this I've done this adding it all to your thing so getting involved in conferences even if you're not speaking or presenting just going networking building that network is going to really 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 help you in the long run so the other thing that I did that I found really helped me was getting involved in scientific communication in that year I became much more active member of the scientific communication community for example getting started posting on LinkedIn I know I say this every time but it's so important posting on LinkedIn or or even just commenting on people's posts on LinkedIn, reaching out to people on LinkedIn. That's another way of building connections and asking for advice in this sort of scenario, you know, that kind of stuff like that really, really helped me get advice on how I could um, get involved in other projects. And also it showed that I was dedicated enough to have an online presence talking about science. So like, again, another way of showing your enthusiasm. This is another like DIY uh, science experience that you can create for yourself is like a podcast or like a YouTube channel or a blog. Like there are loads of ways to write about your interests and it shows that you've actively like gone out and done this because I just feel like that's really important showing that initiative and like showing that you're genuinely interested and you went out and you did this by yourself no one told you to do this I'm just I'm just saying I feel like that really says a lot and it really like shows drive and passion and if you can do that that is a great thing to get involved in so don't forget about scientific communication okay so those are my little actionable steps that I did between failing miserably at the first round of PhD applications to being successful in the second round of PhD applications and let's just go back through that for a second because if you did all of these things you'd go from your current phd application now right cool to your current phd application plus you are the senior editor of an undergraduate journal and the editor of another undergraduate journal with peer review you've published a knowledge summary in rcvs knowledge or you've submitted a literature review to an undergraduate journal or presented it at a conference or whatever you've attended four or five different conferences you've helped out another student on their research project and done that and you've started a blog and a youtube channel like if that doesn't show dedication, then I don't know what does. <laughs> Again, this is in no way a single thing, um, like the way to do things, just a little disclaimer, but I just want to say that's what I did. That is like genuinely like that's just what happened and it worked and here we are today. So I just wanted to share like some of the tips that I had because I felt like honestly, I felt so stuck, so confused and so, so, so lost because like I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to ask. I didn't have any connections in the industry. I didn't have any research experience. No one was willing to give me research experience and I knew I wanted to be here. So I thought, okay, it looks like we've got to do this by ourselves. So I just want to be, I just want to help, you know, and I hope that this has been helpful and if you have any other tips that you want to share then please comment down below don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel for more PhD fun and good luck everyone on your second round of PhD applications okay and I'll see you guys next week for another video bye